Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us this afternoon for the Farmland Preservation Tax Credit Update for County staff. Um, my name is Wednesday Jordan, and I'm with the Wisconsin Department of Agriculture, Trade, and Consumer Protection. And I'm joined here by uh, Randall. Do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Randy Stilling. I work with the Department of Revenue and um, handle the Farmland Preservation Tax Credits uh, that uh, farmers claim. Yeah. Among other things. <laughs> yeah, so we'll be going through this presentation today. Um, we'll go through all the slides together, and then at the end, we'll have some time for questions from you guys. So at that time, you guys can either unmute yourselves or add your questions in the chat as we go through the presentation, and we will answer those at the end. All right, so just to talk a little bit about the Farmland Preservation Program, um, it all starts with the County Farmland Preservation Plan. Now this is um, the plan that really sets up how the program is going to be administered in the county. It sets up where the program can be located within the county. Um, these are done at the county level with local input, so if you have towns that have comprehensive plans, um, you'd want to take those into consideration when you're planning for the future of the farmland preservation program in your county. Um, next, you kind of go into our participation routes. Um, and depending on, you know, what's important to your county, how you want to participate in the program, you can either do one, the other, or pair them together um, to kind of create a unique program for your community. Um, so the first leg of the program is our farmland preservation zoning. Um, these are locally drafted ordinances um, that the zoning municipality can um, uh, put out there for their um, community. Folks that are in their certified farmland preservation zoning district can claim the tax credit if they're meeting the eligibility requirements. Um, the next kind of leg of our program are agricultural enterprise areas. Now these are kind of like districts that don't impose any land use restrictions on like zoning, um, but kind of create an eligibility area for folks to sign farmland preservation agreements. Now to participate in an agricultural enterprise area, there's one extra step of applying for a farmland preservation agreement where farmland preservation zoning, there are no agreements associated with that. Um, our farmland preservation agreements are 15-year contracts between the landowner and the state where they're agreeing to keep their land and agricultural use for the 15 years and maintain the state soil and water conservation requirements for the duration of the contract. Um, eligible participants in both a farmland preservation zoning district and a farmland preservation agreement can claim the tax credit if they meet all of the eligibility requirements. Um, what's really cool is our farmland preservation zoning or farmland preservation zoning districts and agreements can be layered in our, some of our areas, um, so landowners can claim a higher tax credit. Um, I also just want to make a note because we do have um, plenty of pre-July 1st, 2009 agreements um, floating around in the state. They um, may exist outside of an AEA, unlike our current farmland preservation agreement, um, or in a certified farmland preservation zoning district. So if you have those, they can be kind of free floating around in your county. Um, but the rules that we'll talk about for those, um, as far as like claiming the tax credits, we'll go through all of that information and kind of how that works and how it's different from like our current program. All right, so when talking about the farmland preservation tax credit, the first question that you're always gonna be, you know, when you're working with a landowner, when you're talking to them, it's guiding them through the right process. You're gonna to wanna to make sure they're always working on that correct tax schedule. Because we have pre-2009 agreements still floating around out there, um, it creates a situation where you're gonna have people who may be working on one or the other tax schedule. So knowing what kind of questions to ask them will kind of help guide you into figuring out which schedule they should be using. Um, so if you're working with a landowner and they only have a farmland preservation agreement, um, you'll wanna ask them when that agreement was signed. 
So if their agreement was signed before July 1st, 2009, you're going to be using the tax schedule FC. Now, if they have that agreement, it was signed before 2009, but they've gone ahead and applied to modify that agreement to meet current state soil and water conservation standards through a modification process, um, they can go ahead and file using Schedule FCA. Um, if you have a new agreement that was signed after July 1st, 2009, and it's located in an agricultural enterprise area, those folks can file using a Schedule FCA. Um, if you have folks that are in a pre-July 1st, 2009 farmland preservation agreement, and they're located in one of your certified farmland preservation zoning districts, they kind of have some options here. Um, their first option is they can choose to file under Schedule FC and claim at an 80% of the calculated credit based on having an agreement, or they can file um, their tax claim on Schedule FCA and claim the tax credit based on the farmland preservation zoning rate. Um, moving on, if you have folks that are located in a post-July 1st, 2009 farmland preservation agreement, meaning if they're located in a, or they have a current farmland preservation agreement in an agricultural enterprise area, and they're located in a certified farmland preservation zoning district, they will file using Schedule FCA. And if you have any folks that are located in a farmland preservation zoning district and they don't participate um, using any type of agreement, all of those folks are gonna be filing using Schedule FCA. So once you have folks that are kind of set up um, with their agreement, they're um, ready to claim for the program, um, they're meeting all of, you know, they're, they've either applied for an agreement, they're working with you to claim through zoning, these are the eligibility requirements that they have to meet in order to be eligible to claim the tax credit. So the first step of eligibility is being located in a farmland preservation zoning district or having a farmland preservation agreement, and this is kind of the second step to claiming the tax credit. Um, so the first and usually um, the most limiting factor is meeting all the applicable state soil and water conservation standards. Um, and we show that um, in those tax schedules or in at least Schedule FCA through that certification of compliance, uh, which we will talk about in more detail here in the next coming up slides. Um, the second requirement to claim the farmland preservation tax credit is being a Wisconsin resident and the landowner of the eligible land. This means that the um, person, individual, uh, or entity has to have their primary domicile in Wisconsin, and they are the landowners. So this tax credit isn't available to operators who rent the land, but the landowners who own the land could claim the tax credit. Um, that was a little confusing. So if a landowner rents out their land to an operator, they can claim the farmland preservation tax credit, but the operator would not be eligible to claim unless they owned you know, land on their own. Um, the next requirement is that the farmland must have produced $6,000 in gross farm revenue within that tax year, or $18,000 in gross farm revenue within that tax year and the prior two tax years. And the last requirement is that they cannot have claimed the homestead or veterans and surviving spouses property tax credit in the same tax year that they're applying for the farmland preservation tax credit. All right, so depending on how folks or which schedule folks are using to claim the farmland preservation tax credit, will really impact which tax credits are available to them. So if you are having landowner, or if you have landowners that are applying with a pre-2009 farmland preservation agreement and they're filing using Schedule FC, the amount that landowners will be credited um, is based off of their household income 
and the amount of property taxes paid in the applicable tax year. And it's a range of values. There's not like a set value that a person would claim. Um, and generally speaking, lower income and higher property taxes means a higher tax credit. Um, but it's not just like a stagnant number that they could, you know, point to every single year. Um, if you're working with a landowner um, who's filing using Schedule FCA, as part of the instructions for Schedule FCA, there is a table that kind of breaks down what those property tax credits would look like depending on which tax situation they're working with. FC, sorry, yes, under Schedule FC. Now, if you have folks that are in a certified farmland preservation zoning district um, and or they have a current farmland preservation agreement in an AEA or a modified pre-2009 farmland preservation agreement, they are filing under Schedule FCA. Now, what's different about these tax credits is that it's a flat per acre tax credit. Um, we have three different categories of tax credits that are available here, depending on how the person is participating in the program. So the first um, credit that's available is $5 per acre. If that land has a signed farmland preservation agreement in an agricultural enterprise area or a modified pre-2009 agreement, um, the next um, rate that's available is $7.50 per acre if the lands are located in a certified farmland preservation zoning district. Our last rate that's available is $10 per acre if the land has a signed farmland preservation agreement in an agricultural enterprise area or a modified pre-2009 farmland preservation agreement and those lands are located in a certified farmland preservation zoning district. All right, so when you're putting together your claims or if you are working with a landowner who's putting together a claim or they have questions about what they need to include when they're putting together um, a tax claim, um, each of the tax schedules will require a little bit of different things. So first we'll talk about what's required for a Schedule FC. So if you're working with a landowner who has one of those pre-2009 agreements that hasn't been modified, um, they will need to include a copy of their property tax bill for that year the credit is being claimed, a copy of the original farmland preservation agreement um, only if they have not previously submitted that agreement with another year's farmland preservation tax claim. Um, if information has changed on that, you know, if they've um, had any kind of transfer, um, if any lands have been released, then they will need to um, send in a copy um, for that as well. But otherwise, if it's not been changed, um, they wouldn't need to submit an extra copy of that. Um, if the property was bought or sold during that tax credit year, they would need to include a copy of the closing statement with the buyer and seller signatures and a copy of the executive or executive executed deed or land contract if the property was sold that tax year. Um, if the land is in some kind of LLC or a trust or a partnership, um, they would need to provide copy of documentation verifying percent ownership. Um, and then lastly, they would need to include a copy of a statement signed by the county treasurer indicating that the previous year's property tax bills were paid in full. Um, if any of the taxpayers' property tax bills for the year the credit is being claimed is, sh is showed as unpaid. Um, if, if they were shown as paid in full, then they would not need signature from the county treasurer, correct? That's correct. Um, so if you're working with somebody who's claiming using Schedule FCA, so those are the folks that are located in your Certified Farmland Preservation Zoning District, your folks with current farmland preservation agreements in an agricultural enterprise area or a modified pre-2009 agreement, 
Um, these are the things that you'll want to, or if they ask what they need to include on a schedule claim, these are what they'll need to have. So first and foremost is a copy of that certification of compliance that's issued from the county, um, from the county that the eligible farmland is located in. Um, it has to be included every time there's a change or a new one is issued. If the landowner has land in multiple counties, then they should be submitting multiple certifications of compliance um, for each of the counties that a farmland is located in. Um, they will also need to include copies of their property tax bill for the year that the credit is being claimed. Um, they will also need to include a copy of the original or modified farmland preservation agreement if it's the first time that they're filing a claim or if there's been any changes to that agreement. So if they've added land to it, if they've released land from the agreement, um, any kind of change that will need to be um, documented and sent to DOR. If they have not made any change within that tax year, they do not need to send in an additional copy. Um, if the property was bought or sold during that taxable year, they will also need to include a copy of the closing statement with the buyer's and seller's signature and a copy of the executive deed or land contract. Um, again, if the property is owned by any kind of trust, LLC, partnership, um, any kind of uh, organization like that, they will also need to include a copy of documentation verifying percent ownership. All right, so it's pretty common that farmland is bought and sold during the year. Um, it will happen with both folks that are participating through new agreements in zoning or in our pre-2009 agreements. So if the land is sold, um, there's kind of different ways that we um, look at this depending on how they're claiming the tax credit. So if they're participating in a pre-2009 agreement um, and using Schedule FC, the buyer and seller may claim the tax credit based off of the property taxes paid as verified through a closing statement. Um, they need to include a copy of the closing statement with all the buyer's and seller's signatures and a copy of the executive deed or land contract. Um, then for our Schedule FCA, the taxpayer must be the landowner at the end of the year, meaning December 31st. Um, again, you need to include a copy of the closing statement with the buyer and seller's signature and a copy of the executive deed or land contract. Um, additionally, for Schedule FCA, the new landowner, in order to claim the tax credit, must obtain an updated certification of compliance from the local county conservation department verifying compliance on the farm. And when we talk about updated certification of compliance, it has to have the new landowner's information on there, um, along with the new certification of compliance number. All right. So now we're going to talk a little bit about certifications of compliance. Um, and kind of how it relates to um, your workload, how it relates to the process of claiming the tax credit, and um, what DOR is kind of looking for as far as information. And um, we'll go through some best management practices, too, um, when we're working on updating or creating new certifications of compliance for the purpose of claiming the farmland preservation tax credit. So as just a background, beginning in tax year 2016, landowners were required to verify their compliance with state soil and water conservation standards through a certification of compliance on all of their farmland, not just the farmland eligible for the tax credit. Um, compliance um, is verified locally by the County Land Conservation Department. Uh, the certifications of compliance should include all the parcels in the farm, and when we say farm, we mean all parcels under common ownership, primarily devoted to agricultural use, and indicate which of those parcels are eligible to claim the farmland preservation tax credit and under what rate. So basically, you're identifying all of the farm, um, not just those farmlands that are eligible to claim, and then indicating further on that sheet which 
of those parcels are eligible to claim. Um, what's important about this certification of compliance uh, for claiming the tax credit is that unique seven-digit number at the top that has to be included on all Schedule FCA um, forms in order to claim the farmland preservation tax credit. That's uh, one of the numbers that the Department of Revenue kind of uses to verify um, and keep track of that person's uh, compliance on their farm. Um, anytime there are changes of ownership or new land is acquired or sold, the certification of compliance must be updated. Um, every year, I know uh, just uh, yesterday, Monday, say that you sent out the email asking for this. I you, I can't remember. That's okay. Well, every year we ask you guys to send in a spreadsheet, the certification of compliance spreadsheet specifically for the Department of Revenue. And I know uh, Katie recently sent out an email to all the counties asking for this information. Um, but this is what we're asking for. Um, we're looking for just a, you know, an annual record of all of the certification of compliance numbers that are issued in the county, when those were issued, names of landowners, uh, total eligible acres, um, acres under farmland preservation agreements, acres under SP zoning, acres that are under SP zoning and agreements, um, if any notices of noncompliance were issued and the date for that certification of compliant number, and then the date of any cancellation of notices of noncompliance if they were issued for that COC, and then the applicable tax year. Um, I have a little asterisk here on the acres under agreements, zoning, and zoning and agreements. Um, those are optional fields to report, um, but you may receive questions about these from landowners or DOR if it's not included on that report. Um, so it's kind of up to how you are tracking that information, how you receive that information. Those can be excluded, but you may get additional questions um, as they come up, especially if uh, a landowner gets a question from DOR or some kind of letter indicating that. Those uh, three uh, items are what we use to determine the rates. The, the acres that are under the farmland preservation agreement are at the five dollar per acre rate. The ones under the zoning are in the seven fifty, and the one that's both is ten. So it's important for us when they make the claim. If we see that they have a certain number of acres, but we don't know what the rate is, that could be a potential problem. All right. Um, so just to give you guys some information about what happens with the DOR spreadsheets after you submit them, because I know that some of the information that you're submitting in that might be information that you might share with other programs or other departments. Um, so I just wanted to give you guys some more information about what we do with those spreadsheets and kind of how they're used. So after you submit them, uh, DADCAT staff reformat the data for DOR and submit it to them via a secure file. Um, we also store and maintain all of those records for the DOR spreadsheets. Um, from the counties that we received, so we can go back and look to verify. So if you have somebody that has a question about um, a certification of compliance that you may have issued in 2018, but you're not sure, we can go back and see, you know, was there a certification compliance number issued for that landowner in that tax year? Did they have a notice of non-compliance on record? Was that submitted to DOR? We can look that up for you. We keep all of that historic data. Um, once we send it off to DOR, they take that data and put it in the DOR data warehouse. Um, as tax credit, credit claims come through, those claims are compared to the data that's stored in the data warehouse. Um, and that process allows DOR to verify claims and prevent overpayment of the tax credit. Is there anything else you want to add about that? Um, no, that's pretty much it. Sometimes we can also use it to determine if they they might also be underreporting. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that's something that uh, we might contact the taxpayer about also.
All right, so now we're going to talk about some best management practices when you're working with certifications of compliance. Um, we'll go over a couple different scenarios and then um, what you can do given each of those scenarios. Um, so when you're first issuing a certification of a compliance for a landowner, um, you're going to want to list the initial year that you're certifying that landowner is compliance with the state soil and water conservation standards required by the program. So if you went out and were working with a landowner for the first time this year um, in 2020, you want to make sure that you're putting the year, as, or, or 2021, you want to make sure you're putting the year down as 2021. Um, if you're issuing a certification of compliance for a previous tax year for an individual or entity to file a retroactive claim, you'll want to list the first year you were able to verify the eligibility of that individual or entity. Um, if you're retroactively issuing a certification of compliance for a previous tax year, make sure that not only are you, you know, creating that certification of compliance, but you're also updating that DOR spreadsheet and sending it to DATCAP with all of that new information for all of the prior tax years that that certification of compliance is covering. Because again, without that information, the DOR will not have any way to um, verify that what's on that certification of compliance is correct. Um, you may also choose to list a date range in the applicable year field corresponding with the spot check cycle and then reissue the certification of compliance after the next spot check. Um, this kind of demonstrates the first year of eligibility in a cycle and then informs when the next spot check is required. Um, if you need to update a COC, this, these are kind of the steps that we'll go through. Um, if you know land is bought or sold, um, parcel numbers changes, landowners change, um, any reason that you would be updating a COC, even if you went out and did a spot check that year and you just wanted to update the COC and maybe put them on a different schedule um, for doing a spot check. Whatever the case may be, if you're updating it, you want to make sure that you update the applicable year field to reflect the year in which the change occurred. Um, this will help establish a history of changes in eligibility. Um, if you leave the original year in the certification um, in the applicable year field, you can add a note to explain um, the changes to establish that history. That's one option. Um, option two is if you list a date range in the applicable year field to correspond with spot check cycles, um, and then you need to reissue a certification of compliance after a change is made. Uh, you do not need to update the date range, um, but you will want to update your signature date when that certification of compliance is updated and reissued to help document that history of change in eligibility. Um, and then kind of your last option here is if you're not doing a date range, um, and you don't want to leave a note, you can also choose to reissue a certification of compliance. Um, do that on an annual basis if you choose, but it's also not required. Um, if you do reissue certifications of compliance annually to document any kind of changes, um, or it's just like a county policy that you have, you want to make sure that you're updating the applicable year field accordingly. So, Essentially here, if you're making a change, you want to have some kind of documentation showing that a change has happened so we can make a established history going through time. So if you have somebody that comes back in and says, hey, you know, uh, when were these COCs issued, we can look back and kind of document those over time. Um, occasionally, you'll have a landowner asking for copies of their certifications of compliance, um, even if there are no changes. Um, and when they're asking for this, you can do a couple of things. Um, a COC is effective until there is some change in circumstance, meaning uh, they've either purchased or sold some of their land, 
they've had an entity name change, um, they've had a change in compliance, meaning they've gone out of compliance, what have you. Um, tax Schedule FCA instructions note that the enclosure of a certification of compliance with the tax claim is not required if the claimant has previously submitted a certification of compliance with a previous year's claim and the farm's eligible acreage has not changed. So you may choose to make it a policy to reissue these certifications of compliance on an annual basis, but it's not required. Um, if the landowner has already submitted their certification of compliance with a tax claim, um, it should still be on record. Um, the only times when you would be needing to reissue a certification of compliance again is when there is a, uh, you know, change in ownership, purchase of sale, change in compliance, or if it's the end of their cycle, their four-year cycle, and they need an updated certification of compliance. All right, so we talked a lot about certifications of compliances, and now we'll talk a little bit about notices of non-compliance. So what happens when somebody who was previously in compliance comes out of compliance? Um, these notices of non-compliance should be issued to a landowner if they are no longer meeting the soil and water conservation standards on any portion of their property, not just the land eligible to claim the tax credit. So if you have a landowner who only has a portion of their land that's in an eligible area to claim the tax credit, um, and then the rest of their property is outside of that eligible area, they need to be maintaining those standards on all of their property, not just those that are in their farmland preservation agreement or in a certified farmland preservation zoning district. Um, otherwise, they should be getting, you should be issuing them a notice of non-compliance um, so they're not claiming the tax credit for that year. Now, a big note on this is if the landowner is working with your office on a schedule of compliance, you do not need to issue them a notice of non-compliance unless they fall out of compliance with your schedule. So if you're actively working with somebody, um, you know, it was a really rough year one year, they had a lot of goalie erosion, but you know that within the next two years, they're going to be putting in a new grass waterway and they're going to be changing their tilling habits. It just takes time. Um, you do not need to issue them an NON. Um, these are for situations where you have a landowner that is not willing to work with you on a schedule of compliance or a landowner who um, no longer wants to participate in the program, things like that. But if you have somebody willing to work with you, you do not need to just go straight into a notice of non-compliance. Um, but that's really up to, you know, your county and your policies. Now, if you have landowners that are in a pre-2009 agreement, those agreements that were signed before July 1st, 2009, and they have not modified those agreements, um, their lands covered by those agreements must be in compliance with state soil and water conservation standards that were in place at the time they signed their agreements. Um, meaning that they may be subject to different compliance standards than what other folks in the county would be subject to. Um, if you have landowners in your county that have these pre-2009 agreements and you would like to know what standards they are subject to, please send me an email. I can, um, you know, we'll pull the agreement. I'll figure out what year that was signed and I can send you what standards um, they are required to meet for that year. Um, if you do have landowners that come out of compliance with those standards, um, you should be issuing them a notice of non-compliance, but there is a separate form specifically for pre-2009 agreements that is different than our current notice of non-compliance. Um, so if you're in a situation like that, um, feel free to contact me. We can talk a little bit about it just because these situations are a little bit different, because the standards are different, and the form is a little different. Um, so we'll just talk a little bit here about how these notices of noncompliance relate to tax credit claims. Because depending on how the landowner is um, participating in the program and what schedule they're claiming on will change how that notice of noncompliance affects them. 
So if you have a landowner and a pre-2009 agreement that has not been modified and they're claiming on Schedule FB, there must not be an outstanding notice of noncompliance with soil and water conservation standards against the farm at the time of filing a tax credit claim. Um, so this one is a little bit different. It doesn't have, you know, at the end of the year. Um, it's just at the time of filing the tax credit claim. Now, you know, a little bit different and what more people are more used to working with are those folks that are claiming on Schedule FCA, um, meaning that they must not have a notice of noncompliance at the end of the taxable year to which the claim relates. Um, meaning that, you know, if you have a farm that's out of compliance and it's December 31st and they don't come back into compliance, um, then they're not able to claim that tax credit for that tax year. So it's a little different situation here. Um, if you have any questions about how that works for your county, let us know and we can talk about it at the end here. All right, so what's really cool about the Farmland Preservation Program is that a claim may be filed at any time up to four years after the unextended due date of the claimant's income or franchise tax return. Basically meaning that there is um, an automatic extension on farmland preservation tax credit claims for that farm. Um, and for an example here, um, if you have a landowner that wants to claim the 2021 tax credit but they don't get anything in um, next April 15th, they can, they basically have until April 15th of 2026 to claim the 2021 tax credit. Um, a couple special considerations for folks that are interested in filing um, like a back claim, if they're using Schedule FCA, the tax payer must include a certification of compliance that shows that the property was in compliance at the time of filing um, for that tax claim, meaning that they'll have to contact the county and work with you to get a certification of compliance that shows that at that time that they were claiming, they were in fact in compliance. Um, we ask that the county only provide a certification of compliance indicating that the farm was in compliance um, during a prior year if the county is confident that that farm was in fact in compliance. So if you're in a situation where you have a landowner that wants to claim uh, or wants to make a claim for 2018, but you are not confident that anybody was out there to do a farm inspection, um, you can't locate like a nutrient management plan, you're not super confident whether or not the farm was in compliance, you can make the call not to give them a certification of compliance that year because you can't verify or you're not confident that the farm was in fact in compliance. Uh, would you like to talk a little bit about this? Sure, sure. Um, as we had previously mentioned, you know, we take a look at these claims, match them up with what we have on our data warehouses, which is the equivalent of DATCAP's information that you send to them. And if we see, uh, over or under your claiming, or if there's a notice of not compliance that's hanging out there, uh, we could be ending up sending uh, a letter to the taxpayer. Uh, and as the example that we gave up there, you know, that the certificate of compliance provided by the claimant doesn't match what's on the data warehouse, or the certificate of compliance was never provided by the claimant and the county does not submit to DATCAP the acres part under the farmland preservation the zoning or the both. I had talked about that earlier that if uh, if we can't determine through data warehouse and the taxpayer doesn't provide that sort of compliance, uh, that's when we'll be either contacting them or contacting you to get a feel for, even though there's a certain number of acres currently eligible, we, if we don't know the rate, we're gonna have to ask. Um, that letter from us may result in the taxpayer contacting you, uh, or like I said, we might do a direct note. Yeah, so if you do get a landowner that contacts you, um, some of those letters uh, do require a timely response. So 
um, we do ask that you try to work with them as quickly as you're able to um, so they're able to get that information back to the Department of Revenue. All right, so we talked a lot about claiming the tax credit and who's eligible for which tax schedule, um, and now we can cover how to determine which areas in your county or across the state are eligible to participate in the program. Um, if you're in a county that has a certified farmland preservation zoning district, a great place to start is contacting your local zoning administrators for updated maps of areas in the certified farm for areas that are covered by a certified farmland preservation zoning district. So this could be, you know, county zoning administrators, um, town zoning administrators, um, even like some other municipalities like cities or villages. Um, if your local zoning administrators do not provide annual rezone reports to your office, um, meaning that they don't send you lists of places that have been rezoned out of these certified farmland preservation zoning districts, please feel free to contact us and we can forward you those reports so you can keep an updated list of, you know, which parcels in your county may be eligible to claim the tax credit or participate in the program. Um, we can also, you know, if you have an agricultural enterprise area in your county, we can provide you updated shape files for those um, that cover your county. Um, we also keep a shape file of all of our farmland preservation agreements. Um, if you'd like to know where those are located in your county, let us know and we can send you a shape file of those. Um, we can also supply your office with any additional copies of the agreements. Um, any of the pre-2009 agreements or post-2009 agreements upon request. So if you're working with a landowner and you need an additional copy or you know, you're know you trying to find agreements from this year to this year, just let us know. We can get you copies of those, either paper or digital. Um, we're more than happy to work with you to get those. Um, here's a list of online resources for the farmland preservation tax credit. Um, so first I'd like to point out our, our um, home page is a great place to start if you have landowners that are just interested in getting started with the program. This is a great place to, you know, have them go to. If you're working with tax preparers, we also have a web link that specifically goes to information for tax preparers and resources for them in filing a tax credit for a landowner. Um, and we also have a web page that's dedicated just to conservation compliance for the farmland preservation program. This is where you're going to find um, copies of the certifications of compliances, the notices of noncompliance, um, sample farm inspection reports, um, and then also those pre-2009 um, farmland preservation agreements. Notices of noncompliances are also located there. Um, DOR has a great farmland preservation uh, credit, frequently asked questions um, that's linked on here that goes through a lot of different scenarios that a landowner may be working through when filing a tax credit claim. Um, and they also put together a great um, publication each year for filing for the farmland preservation tax credit that's called Publication 503. That's updated annually, and it has a lot of detailed information and instructions in there on what you need to, um, who can file for a tax credit, um, what is required by each tax schedule, how to determine which tax schedule you, should, you can file, and then also um, contact information for the Department of Revenue's farmland preservation team. So if you're working with a landowner you can, um, who's working on filing a tax credit claim, you can direct them to both of those DOR resources, which are great and are very helpful um, navigating those. This is our contact information for the Farmland Preservation Program. Um, you can contact DOR's Farmland Preservation Tax Credit Team through either their phone or their email that's listed on here. And we can send this email out, or this PowerPoint out to you guys so you guys don't have to worry about copying all this information down or um, taking down the Farmland Preservation Program team at DadCat's phone number down wrong because it has an extra two in there. Um, 
but we'll get this information out to you guys. So if you guys do have questions, you want to call UR, you want to contact DadCap um, using this information, we'll make sure you get it. All right, so I know we covered a lot of information. Um, we can talk about that now with you guys. If you have any questions, um, we will open up the floor. All right, it looks like we do have a couple of questions in the chat, so we'll go from the questions in the chat and starting out here. Can you scroll up to the top? All right, so Paul asked, who is eligible for the tax credit if the property is sold during the tax year? So it really depends, and I can go back to that slide here. So when we're talking about claiming the farmland preservation tax credit after the change of ownership of eligible lands, um, it's really simple if you have landowners who are claiming through uh, a certified farmland preservation zoning district or those who are claiming um, through a farmland preservation agreement in an agricultural enterprise area, um, the only folks who are eligible to claim that tax credit are the landowners at the end of the year, which is December 31st. So if they purchase the land of on December 30th, then they're the ones who are eligible to claim the tax credit. Um, yeah. One thing I'd like to point out there is um, at that time of closing, that is something that can be brought up yeah. uh, that you can, if you're the seller, you can ask for basically a proration of what that credit would be for that time period. So there is a way for both, in both cases, that the buyer and the seller can get their fair share of that credit. They're just done two different ways because one's based on property taxes and one's based on ownership. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, so, but but that would be between the buyer and the seller individually, right? That's not something that's sorted out. The scenario you just mentioned, that's not sorted out by the DOR, is it? That That is correct. But a lot of times we get calls from uh, people that are selling their land and wondering what they can do, and they're uh, concerned that they're not getting their credit. And then it's more of a way how they can do it. And if after yeah. it's closed, yeah. if, they don't, if they didn't do it after it's closed, or before it's closed, then that opportunity is gone and the, the buyer is gonna get all that credit. Yep. But if they if they do their research and ask around before they actually get to closing, they can set up an arrangement, but it is completely between them and the seller. Gotcha. Okay, thank you. That answered my question. Yeah, so your next question on here is, who's responsible for initiating the update of the certification of compliance if the land is sold? So it's kind of a loaded question that has a lot of different answers depending on the specific situation. Um, <laughs> there are some counties that uh, don't get updates in their system of like new ownership until like February of the following year. So they may not know that a landowner has changed um, by the end of that tax year. Um, there are some counties that like send out those you know, their COCs or their self-certifications out based off of those lists. So if that's not updated in the county system, they might not have access to it. Um, I think yeah. the short answer here is to tell you the burden is on the landowner to provide accurate and up-to-date information. They're okay. also the burden is on the landowner to not fraudulently claim. Yeah. yeah. That And that's, that's what I wanted to get at. Um, we have a database that'll tell us basically what property is sold, but when you have as you know 170,000 acres that are in certificates of compliance, pretty much every piece of property that's sold in the county is probably attached to some sort of certificate. So we issue or reissue probably well over 100 certificates. It sounds like every year just to make sure that they're up to date, but. We try to consolidate that within a time frame of our own, because otherwise, if we waited for people to let us know that they bought and sold 
property throughout the year, um, you'd be working on certificates of compliance just about every day. Um, so just wanted to make sure that it was clear who was responsible for really contacting us to let us know that that property is sold. We go through a lot of the hoops and loops already for them, but if something's not right on that certificate, it's not necessarily our fault, I guess, so. At, at the same point, if you do discover it, even if it's after the fact, you know, we have four years to make that kind of correction. Yeah. They're going to want it right away when they're doing their taxes, though. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. I'm just saying, when you <laughs> you can kind of look at it as all being on the same team in the sense that they're supposed to tell you, but if you find out about it, whenever you do find out about it, as long as you make that adjustment, you know, we got plenty of time to catch that correction. So it's basically four years. Yep, yep. All right, so our next question in here is from Katie. And she asks, for landowners who own land in multiple counties, how would you recommend having a status review? Should the two counties work together on the review so the reviews are on the same schedule? The past, um, and I do believe that this is what is in uh, DATCAP FAQ for counties for information related to conservation compliance, we recommend some coordination between uh, counties, whether you're going to work together on the review or if you're going to coordinate reviews in the same year, just being that you talk to each other. Um, generally speaking, we also respect the fact that you want to administer, administrate matters in your own jurisdiction. So it, it's kind of one of those things to just make sure that there's some level of communication where you know this is happening. One other point there is if they're in two different counties, there's two different certs that are involved. If either one of them are issued a non-compliance, it would take care, uh, it would make all the other certs non-compliant in the sense they couldn't claim the credit. You, you control your own cert if they're in compliance in your county, you just operate as if they're in compliance. When they uh, file their claim though, if we have a certificate of non-compliance, in another county, we take out that entire farm because the entire farm across the state has to be in compliance. So you don't necessarily have to work together for that purposes. Although you might have, to, you might recommend, you know, that cat might recommend that you do. It's a matter of communication. It's yeah, not yeah, to say yeah. that you're going to go into somebody else's county and not tell them and just happen to do a spot check there. We want you guys to be in some level of coordination. And and what does that mean? I we're not I, I get what I this is Paul from Fond du Lac. I get what you're saying, but I'm not gonna reach out to every single county that might own property that this landowner might own property to do a certificate for Fond du Lac County. There's two are there's already going to be multiple certificates. I'm responsible for certifying the land that's in Fond du Lac County. They're going to have an individual certificate. I don't know what level of communication we have to have, but that that's the way that it's been, and it seems like it's working. And if the certification um, gets issued a notice of noncompliance in another county, it's going to get kicked out for the whole thing. So I don't know what, what other communication there needs to be um, between us and another county where land may be jointly owned. I guess I'm confused on it. So, Paul, I think to put it like statutorily, I, I can't tell you that you have to call your neighbor. And in, in terms of some counties put a little bit more emphasis on they won't issue a COC unless they're certain that the whole farm is in compliance. So in terms of what we like, kind of like Randy's saying here, you're responsible for your jurisdiction if, if you are able to communicate. You know, that that's historically that's what we've encouraged. But in terms of also, we understand that that creates an additional administrative burden, and I can't tell you that that has to happen. Yeah, would thank it, you. Would the, new, would the nutrient management plan, plan generally be the one plan for the entire farm, or do they kind of break it down by counties there? That'd be about the one example I could think of where communication might be helpful. Yeah, we're we're certifying we're certifying the land that's in Fond du Lac County has a nutrient management plan when we 
when we do the uh, certification. And I think every county is probably approaching it the same way. I mean, we have a we have a thousand, almost a thousand claimants um, claiming the tax credit and 170 thousand acres claiming the credit. We can't we can't check every piece of land that's in another county to to see if it's in compliance or not. So what I'm saying is maybe that plan has multiple counties in it, and maybe that's something that could be shared with other counties. I'm I'm, I'm not sure. It's not really my area. That's the only thing yeah. I can think of as an example. M maybe. Yeah, there's but there are some counties that may ask, you know, like a question on their self-certification of, hey, do you own land in other counties? And, hey, is yeah. is that land, does that land have a COC on it? Yeah. You know, like that that may be as simple as it gets, you know, as yeah. far as like what kind of communication. So, yeah, I, I think when it comes to the nutrient management planning, I think there is some correspondence between our agronomists and other counties agronomists or whoever is managing nutrient management, there's going to be some correspondence back and forth there. But I'm here to tell you, it's really hard to um, keep track of everybody else's land if they own land in other counties and if it's in compliance or not. And, and at the end of the day, we're going to be responsible for the land that's in Fond du Lac County and certify if it's in compliance. And that'll probably be as far as we may go. Sounds good. Thank you all for the information because it just it gets a little confusing. Yeah, like yeah. you said, Paul. And, well, and, I, and I'm just coming from the perspective. I know that yeah. at one time, a long time ago, there was talk to only have one certificate for one farm if it was in multiple counties, and that just that just can't happen. So um, it's going to end up being multiple certificates in multiple counties, and I think each county has to kind of deal with it on their own. So sounds good. Thanks. Yep, thank you. All right, uh, we're gonna go on to Landon's question. So he says, going back to the Schedule FCA compliance deadline, with December 3rd or 31st being the deadline for compliance, does this mean that we cannot issue a notice of non-compliance or a cancellation of a notice of non-compliance applicable to that year's certification of compliance after December 31st? If not, does this contradict our ability to provide a certification of compliance to a landowner who wants to retroactively claim um, tax credit? Um, so to answer your first part, um, we do acknowledge that sometimes um, if you are issuing like notices of non-compliances or cancellations of non-compliance and they need to go through um, your committee and you might not meet in December to sign those, um, you can like backdate those um, if you, you know, have the, you know, the proof or you're certain that they did meet those requirements to either be issued a notice of noncompliance or be issued a cancellation of noncompliance. Um, so that's, that is a way that you can like retroactively issue them to keep them eligible for that tax year, especially because we do recognize that December is a super busy month for people, not only just taking vacation, but also like end of the year wrap up stuff. Um, and then some counties do not have um, meetings that month. So and issue those backwards. Um, as far as does it contradict your ability to provide a certification of compliance to a landowner who wants to retroactively claim um, the only thing that would contradict your ability to do that is that if in that tax year that they're trying to claim, you go back and look through the historic data or you ask the department of, or you ask us here at DATCAP to look back at that tax schedule. If you had a notice of noncompliance on file at that time, then you couldn't issue them a COC to claim that tax credit for that tax year. Um, does that answer your question, Landon? Do you have any additional follow-up for that question? Okay, All right. Ashley has a question here. So I have a pre-2009 agreement that is outside of a new AEA. Is there any way that this farmer will be eligible for the SPP program after their contract expires? Um, 
unfortunately, um, if a landowner who's participating in the farmland preservation program through a pre-2009 agreement, and they are not located in an agricultural enterprise area or a certified farmland preservation zoning district, once their contract expires, they will not be able to um, continue to participate in the program. Now, you know, there may still be some time between now and when their contract expires. Um, you may have the opportunity to either modify your agricultural enterprise area to extend to where their location is. Um, it may be an opportunity to explore like a certified farmland preservation zoning district in that area. Um, it really depends, but unfortunately, unless they're located in an eligible participating area at the time their contract expires, they won't be able to continue to participate in the program. All right, we have a question from Brian. We have a modified agreement that expired in March 2021. How many more years after the 2021 tax year can the landowner file for the tax credit? Uh, any agreement that expires um, during a tax year, that is the last tax year that they can claim the tax credit. Um, if you have a case where the landowner wants to back claim a tax or back claim a credit, um, they could, but they could only claim the credit up to um, that last year. So for this example, that landowner could only claim the tax credit up to tax year 2021. Right. Um, we have a question from Laura. Out of curiosity, what happens if the landowner um, owns or qualifies for 100 acres of SPP land or SPP tax credits, but the county has 150 acres on their certification of compliance? Um, in this example, a parcel was sold without the county's knowledge. Will they receive the credit for 100 acres or 150 acres? What should happen is, that gets back to the property tax bills. You know, they, it sounds like, sounds like in this particular case on our data warehouse, that cert will show us active for 150. If, uh, but at the same point, if the taxpayer doesn't have uh, property tax bills for that total amount, let's say there's only, let's say they only provide the, uh, the, 100, the 100 acres worth of property tax bills, that's when they'd get a letter saying we have an incomplete list of property tax bills. If they sent the paper cert in for 150, we probably would list the parcels that we're not seeing on there. If, if we don't have the, the, the paper uh, cert of compliance, we'll say we're, we're missing some cert, we're missing some property taxes, provide them. And at that particular point, they wouldn't be able to provide those property tax bills because they wouldn't have been sent to them. That's generally how we would hope it would happen. Ultimately, the burden of properly claiming and not fraudulently claiming the tax credit is on the landowner. So if for whatever reason, they at the end of the year do not own all 150 acres, but they do claim on 150 acres, if the current landowners were to also claim on that 50 acres and they had all the documentation showing that it was, you know, owned by the new landowners, like they had the closing documentation, that would be flagged by DOR as well. Correct. And, you know, we have our four-year statute of limitation too. So, it, you know, on the odd shot that they got their credit for the 150, and let's say your, that person comes into the county and wants to set up his uh, cert, and then we see that, you know, we got time, we got time to catch things like that also. Um, on, on a side note a little bit, because this is so complicated um, and there are a lot of kind of honest mistakes that are done here, uh, this credit is one of the few credits that if there's a mistake and we end up either billing out or issuing a refund that there's no interest involved. Because, you know, four years of interest can be quite pricey on this, so we've decided that there's not going to be any interest on it. Uh, billing out of credits done in error or even intentionally. 
All right, we have a question from Fred. What about farms? What about farms that have SP under one entity, but then the farm is under several different entities, and they submit a nutrient management plan under the same entity as what's under the SP agreement? Okay, I think I understand what you're asking. So what happens when you have one landowner who owns land under multiple different entities, um, but they're putting their nutrient management plan under each entity. So you have like farm A, farm B, and farm C, and nutrient management plan, farm A, farm B, farm C, but it's all run by farmer. Um, the way that chapter 91 defines farm, defines a farm, is all land under common ownership, primarily devoted to agricultural use. So we have to treat each of those entities um, and each of, you know, all the land covered by the entity as a separate farm for the purpose of the farmland preservation program. So even though we know that the farmer may be operating all three of those farms or he is a, um, has stake in each of the entities that owns those farms, we still have to treat each of those farms as a separate entity um, for the purpose of participating in the farmland preservation program and for the purpose of claiming the farmland preservation tax credit um, and for the purposes of issuing certifications of compliances. So if he's submitting a nutrient management plan um, for the land that's all under the same ownership structure, um, that would be okay, as long as that nutrient management plan is covering all of the lands that are owned by that ownership structure. Does that make sense, Fred? Okay, it looks... <laughs> Okay. All right. We have a question from Amy. Um, is there any way to have a separate form for voluntary waivers? Landowners are confused when they receive a notice of noncompliance for voluntarily waiving their rights to the program. Based on the justifications under at CAP 50.16 for voluntarily opting out. So that's why it's on the non. Um, so one important thing to note about a notice of noncompliance, if the landowner is voluntarily waiving their rights, um, folks who participate through zoning um, can voluntarily waive their rights through a notice of noncompliance. Um, landowners who participate through a farmland preservation agreement, and this is for both a pre-2009 farmland preservation agreement and our current farmland preservation agreements in our agricultural enterprise areas, those folks cannot voluntarily waive their rights to compliance. Um, they have committed to the terms of the agreement that they signed, which include meeting the state soil and water conservation standards. So that's something to just be aware of if you're working with folks who are in an agreement, um, just letting them know if they voluntarily waive their rights, they will be in violation of their agreement, and then they'll have to talk about releasing lands from an agreement or coming back into compliance. All right, I think that we've reached the end of the questions in the chat. Now I'll open it up to anybody that wants to ask a question. Um, now, not through chat, if you wanna unmute yourself and ask us anything. Oh, this is Fred. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. Next question I have is we're, you know, we're starting to have where some of these lands are being sold. Um, so one farmer, I guess, sells to another farmer, uh, the new owner, um, I guess through circumstances, doesn't know that the land was under farmland preservation, um, doesn't want to claim the tax credit, doesn't, you know, isn't required to do an MMP 
uh, say they have a post or pre-ordinance pit, so they're not required to. Uh, how do we handle that? Because um, after I've been at this for two years now, I see there are prior ones that we have a file that just says no tax claim uh, because they're not willing to do a nutrient management plan and they're not wanting the farmland pres tax credit. Yeah, so it really depends on how they're participating in the program. Um, if they're participating through zoning alone, then that's okay. They can sign that notice of non-compliance and voluntarily waive their rights because they don't want to claim the tax credit um, and they don't want to participate in the program. But if they're purchasing land that's covered by an active farmland preservation agreement, they still have to meet the conservation compliance standards um, regardless of if they claim the tax credit or not. Um, it's one of those situations where even if they don't know at the time of purchase, if they didn't do a title search on their property, so they might not be aware of an agreement, it doesn't mean that they're still not subject to the terms of the agreement. Um, all of our farmland preservation agreements, even our pre-2009 agreements are recorded with the register of deeds. So they do show up on a title search. Um, so I think, you know, if folks are doing their due diligence, they would know if they are subject to an agreement. Um, so they would still need to be working with your office to have at least those farm visits, making sure that their pit is still, you know, meeting all, you know, is not leaking, it's still up, you know, up kept if they have cattle um, or any like, you know, sheds or anything that they're meeting any of those requirements that they're doing any kind of farming out on their field, all of that is taken care of. Does that, does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, maybe I'll call somebody a, a little more in depth on it again. Um, okay. I think yeah. this is, this is Paul from Fond du Lac. I think it, it kind of begs a, a larger question though is that if a landowner is in compliance and was claiming farmland preservation and they had their nutrient management plan done and they sold their land to somebody that doesn't want to participate in farmland preservation and doesn't want to do nutrient management technically that land was previously in compliance don't they have to keep doing it and I think that's the question that we kind of run into all the time here is that technically it's it's been meeting compliance and it should be maintaining that nutrient management plan regardless of whether the landowner wants to the new landowner wants to do it or not it's in compliance so suggestions on how to address that all of that is the ultimate question of the perpetuity question so you know in you know retrospect you know so the, the standard for nutrient management suggests that once you meet compliance that you're um, going to persist in compliance. The, the struggle with the separation between the programs is you know, the logic of the statutes also set up some aspects for voluntary opt-out of FP, then how do you for enforce Compliance and perpetuity through NR 151. That is uh, a little bit out of my area, but from my understanding, he's saying that uh, they're not claim they're not claiming the credit, but they're not providing nutrient management plans, or so they're so essentially they're voluntarily coming out of the program. But the way our st our other statutes are written, uh, uh, egg performance. For mitigating runoff, basically okay. say once you meet standards, that the goal is is that you do this. That land should not require you know cost share again to help them get back in. Okay, so it's like after it's, after they've their farm and preservation agreement is run out, and then their penalties for not being so in is, it or this is not just agreement; it's kind of the the long-term discussion of how do you achieve long-term compliance after someone's been in a voluntary program and it, it's kind of things 
aspects of statutes. It's one of this is structured to be voluntarily, although a term is attached, and one of them is basically the goal is to get the state to have compliance with a runoff standard. Mm -hmm. So it's kind mm -hmm. of it's very difficult to enforce. Okay. So this is the the long term horizon of the the best thing to say here is is I don't have a best answer. Okay. Because, yeah. It's, it looks like it's your county, me. Uh, Excuse me, this is Greg Leonard in Eau Claire County. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, yeah. we can hear you. Uh, my understand, Paul, I remember this question from several years back, and my understanding was that, yes, we have assumed they're in compliance with NR 151 by participating in farmland preservation. If they decide to drop out of farmland preservation, the only hook, if you will, is if you have sent them out the formal notice as required by NR 151 that your farm is in compliance with NR 151. So if you have sent them that formal notification, then they must maintain compliance. Or sent a certificate of compliance. A certificate of compliance for farmland preservation is not the same thing as a NR-151 notice that you are in compliance. Hi, this is Erin from Door County. I do agree with that. The certificate of compliance from uh, for the purposes of FPP isn't the same as the notification, but you can use that for identifying whether or not the farm has been in compliance with those standards in the past. Because uh, NR151 itself allows for using a variety of um, materials to, to determine whether or not that farm has existing non-compliance. You can look at conservation plans, you can look at past nutrient management plans, um, and other information that you have, you aren't necessarily tied to having had issued that formal notice of compliance to the firm. Exactly, yes. So, you know, I, I think the, what Aaron is reinforcing, is kind of the, the dichotomy here is, is using FPE to early identify and help achieve compliance, mm -hmm. but in terms of enforcing perpetuity, there are notification requirements from the egg runoff performance standards that say, hey, the expectation is, is that you implement this for forever. Um, there's also notification requirements that they come out of compliance. It's it's constant conundrum of implementing through enforcement or voluntary voluntary mechanism. That sort of compliance document that at one point they had all of their runoff and stuff addressed, and if they're asking for something to help address that problem already documentation that's already been done once and yeah it, it's also a struggle of it's a constant struggle of until as well mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. affects this program so it's, it's a larger large web and this is what all of the counties who you know mm -hmm. interjected here are documenting is this, this other pro mechanisms to help okay. achieve compliance it's, it's just kind of a also takes time to basically re-achieve that sure. okay okay we have about 10 minutes left here does anybody else have any additional questions or things that they want to chat about here All right, if we don't have any other questions, um, I will put our contact information back up here for you guys. Oops, went too far. Um, 
please feel free to contact either myself or Randy over at DOR with any questions that you have. Um, if you have like uh, specific circumstances or a crazy out of left field question from a landowner regarding the Farmland Preservation Program or the Farmland Preservation Tax Credit, please feel free to send us an email or give us a call. We're always happy to talk through um, any of these situations uh, with you. But with that, um, I have nothing else to talk about. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and we will also make this recording available for you guys. Um, so just let us know if you would like that at all.